Yeah, look, it's it's basically, if you think of the concept of holism, which is about integrating, uh, it was just having a science-based version of that because the word holism has become a little bit bastardised in that, you know, a lot of people now think of holism when you say holism, it's tarot cards and rune stones and stuff like that. Um, and not that, 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 you know, I'm completely anti those things, it's just... It's about science-based integration. That, that's really what I'm talking about with that. Well, the, the, I think there's, there's lots of linkages. I mean, when I'm talking to corporates, I draw in the linkages from the military and, and, and also from the athlete world. And, and really, it's about what are the traits and rituals of peak performers. And I think that's very applicable for the club environment. And um, just in terms of what are the sort of things that you need to do to be on top of your game, whatever your game may be. And it's really about, um, you know, even if you work in a job that isn't physical at all and you're just using your brain all day, well, it's understanding that, that the brain is completely reliant on the body's health for the brain to be healthy and to function well. Um, so it, it's just taking that understanding and applying it to whatever my job is if i actually am exercising i'm going to be better at my job if i'm eating well my mind is going to function my brain is going to function better and i'm going to be better at my job um, but it's also then breaking that thing down into little things that athletes do very well and the military do very well which is around the rituals around how you do things and that consistency of effort Let's take nutrition first of all. Um, we know that everything that you eat um, is going to affect you at a cellular level and, and it is going to impact on brain. So there, there are certain nutrients that are really important for the brain. Omega-3 fatty acids um, from, from fish and other things uh, are, are vital for brain health and, and for the brain to work effectively and to combat depression and things like that. But we also know there's a lot of compounds in particularly in vegetables and in berries that are actually neuroprotective. So they actually help to protect your brain cells and, and actually protect you against things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stuff like that. So I like to get people thinking of nutrition um, in terms of feeding their ecosystem because that's really all we are is an ecosystem. A lot of people think about food in terms of how it tastes, but don't think about what this is doing to the cells of my body. And everyone knows what happens when you screw with the trees in the Amazon and how it affects the ecosystem of the earth. And it takes decades for it to happen. And it's the same in us. You don't notice the effects immediately, but over time, you notice the effects and they're very, very widespread. So that's the nutrition side of things. When, when we take physical activity, um, we are completely dependent on physical activity. Our genome, that of Homo sapiens, which we now are, has been around for 45,000 years. And in all of those 45,000 years, apart from maybe the last 30, we have been in an environment of high physical activity. And our genome is actually dependent upon us moving um, a lot for it to function well. We know when, when you even do one bout of exercise, you get a massive upregulation of genes that help improve your metabolism at a cellular level, protect you against heart disease, diabetes, all of those sorts of things. There's also genes that improve your immune system. There's genes activated that are anti-aging genes. In fact, the best anti-aging therapy is, is exercise. Um, but most of the genes that are activated by exercise are actually to do with brain health and plasticity. And exercise also will affect certain neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which some people may have heard of. Serotonin is, is largely involved in mood but also in sleep and cognition. And dopamine is involved in pleasure, but also motivation and, and perseverance and those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, when we exercise, it is really good for the brain on a number of different levels. And the last thing that physical activity does directly in the brain is it strengthens the area in the, in the right frontal lobes that we know is the area for self-control and willpower. So, you know, when you take all of that together, you can see that, that physical activity and nutrition are absolutely vital for brain health and performance. It's really hard for me to emphasize enough how important social connections are. Um, the brain is a social organ. We, we know that. We know that 
Um, for instance, recent research has shown that social rejection activates the same areas in the brain that physical pain activates. So social pain equals physical pain in the brain. Um, and we know that actually when you're socially rejected, it, it also um, releases inflammatory markers at a cellular level. So inflammatory markers are things that cause chronic disease. So not only does it affect you in terms of, of, of how it feels in the brain, but it also affects your physical health as well. Um, on the flip side of things, we know that, that social connectedness, this whole idea of what we call relatedness, is, is extremely important for humans. And, and for all as far back in, in evolution, um, humans have been part of a tribe. That, that, that's really key. And I think all sporting clubs are a tribe. And we all want to be part of a tribe. In fact, every one of us is a member of a number of different tribes. And it's that sense of belonging that creates a collective identity um, that is very, very important um, for somebody's level of, of engagement in life. And in fact, there's research to show that people in their 70s, if they're not a member of a social group, they, and they join one social group, they improve their life expectancy by five years, which is, is pretty profound. So we can see this, this whole socialization, it, it, it is really quintessential to what it is to be human, to be part of a tribe. And sporting clubs are, like I said earlier, they're a tribe and they're one of the best forms of a tribe for me because they link in that physical activity as well, um, which we, just, we talked about earlier about how important that is for the brain. So. I think social clubs are really um, a very strong um, part of the fabric of society. Well, look, I think all of us live reasonably stressful lives now. Um, you know, if you look at the research, um, Australians are actually leading the world in terms of the stress. Um, the, the last census showed that 11% of Australians and we're reporting either high or very, li very high levels of distress. Um, and also in terms of depression, um, we've got very high rates of depression in this country. I think some of that is because of agencies like Beyond Blue, where you know, it's socially acceptable to stick your hand up and say that. But there is no doubt um, a high incidence of it. Now, for me, this is also very strongly linked into the fact that Australians work more hours than any other Western country. Um, it doesn't quite fit the concept of the Aussie bludger that we kind of have back in the UK and Ireland because there's actually a high amount of work hours here. So this is all tied in and, and I think um, as a society we, we need to deal with stress. And there's a lot more stress than there was in the 1950s. Um, and, and it's key to understand that our stress response system evolved over millions of years in response to and these very real threats in the environment. So we've got two main stress response systems. The first one is the fight or flight, and that is beautifully designed for three minutes of screaming terror in the African savanna when you're being chased by a lion. Um, and it mobilizes all of the tissues, it dumps blood sugar in, gets your heart rate up, your blood pressure up, it pumps blood to your muscles to enable you to get the hell out of there or to fight for your life. But now it's things like traffic and work deadlines and arguments with colleagues and money worries and kids that activate the same uh, response system. And if we're not running away or fighting, that the very act of doing that burns up the stress hormones. And the fact that we're sitting, all of this stuff rises and it kicks in another longer term stress response, which is to do with hormones, the hormone cortisol, and that can be very destructive over time. So it's really learning um, about where, where stress, our stress response system has come from and the fact that now our stressors have changed and that we are activating this system, which should be a system that's just switched on every now and then in terms of danger. It's becoming switched on um, almost permanently in some people. And that is very, very detrimental to both physical health and mental health um, and, and, and brain health in terms of Alzheimer's and things like that. So in terms of the sporting club, I think learning those stress management strategies is, is very, very effective. But actually sport and exercise is one of the most effective stress management strategies. So not only do, 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 do these guys need to know about it, but they're actually doing something about it, which is great. So bringing those people together and also that socialization is, is a good way to bust stress. 
Laughter is a great stress buster. Just getting your mind, you know that sort of, the, 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 what I call the noise, the background noise of all this thinking about this and that and the other thing. You're not doing that when you're doing sport. You're in um, um, what's called the flow state. A famous psychologist, Mihaly Chesmat Mihaly, talked about this flow state that's very, very beneficial um, for physical and mental health. And, and sport puts you in that fo- sort of flow state has all of the, the benefits of that community aspect of things, but also is burning up stress hormones. So, you know, it, it's, it's a great place to get rid of stress. Yeah, so my, my, my um, introduction to Israel was, was when I was quite young. I was only 20, 21, and I went on a kibbutz for three months. And, and you know, it was good because it was, it was getting me out of my environment. It was, you know... Um, just the sense of um, getting outside of that comfort zone. But I met um, guys there who, from all over the world, and that really piqued my interest in travel. So I ended up you know, doing a lot of backpacking for a lot of years and seeing a lot of the world, which gave me a really good sense of perspective on things. You know, I, I think I'm a big fan of exposing yourself to different cultures, but also visiting third world countries to see how bad some people have it. And I think... And when you do that, you realize that we actually get stressed out by little things that aren't actually stressful at the end of the day. You know, if you're in Somalia watching your child die very slowly every day through hunger and not being able to do something about it, that's stress. You know, our traffic and all of those sort of issues aren't actually real stress. But I think in, in terms of um, life lessons, the, the Amazon was... was quite a significant one. I did a, a three-week um, expedition deep into the Amazon jungle with a, a friend of mine, an Italian guy, and we went to visit some um, Matzes Indians um, deep in the jungle, 2,000 miles from the, or 2,000 kilometers from the nearest road. And it was pretty tough going in the Amazon. You know, we were in dugout canoes for three days, then hiking through the jungle for three days, and mo- three more days in dugout canoes. And and when we got to the Matsyas Indians, um, we actually went through a rite of passage, um, which was very interesting. It involved getting holes burnt into our arms and frog poison um, put into our arms, um, which I'll, I'll spare you the gory details, but it was um, pretty significant, pretty pretty high on the stress level. And actually, from some point, I thought I was being sacrificed. Uh, but <laughs> it was a good experience in terms of, of just going through that, um, you know, I called it resilience training, that whole three weeks in a very uncomfortable environment with big, nasty insects and, and you know, not eating for a couple of days. And, and one other day I had a boiled monkey's arm for dinner. And, you know, to, I think it's good to get out of your comfort zone every now and then. So um, I, the Amazon certainly provided lots of that. So by, by the way, like I, I created it years ago um, for my own clients when, when I realized, you know, I was a physiologist and, and, and a nutritionist and I'd write these programs and I thought people can't fail and, and some of them did. And then I realized that it was all about engagement and, 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 and having people have meaning. And, and I remember seeing a guy talking about health information and, and what we have done very, very badly in, in all of the, the sort of areas of health is our presentation of health information. We present it in a way that's meaningful to doctors, physiologists, physiotherapists, personal trainers, and means nothing to the end user. And, you know, we talk to them about their blood pressure, their cholesterol, and, and the brain just doesn't engage with it. So all I did with BioAge is took all of the fitness testing stuff that a lot of gyms would do and, and some other clinical ones for the clinical version, put it into an algorithm and, and actually created an age. Because when you get an age, all of a sudden it's meaningful. You know, if you're 40 and your BioAge is 48, and um, that makes you sit your frontal lobes, sit up and take notice and go, whoa, hold on a minute, I need to do something about it. And people are motivated about getting younger. They're not intrinsically motivated about lowering cholesterol by two points or getting their blood pressure down or whatever that may be. Um, so it's all about um, how you hook in to people in terms of engagement. And then when somebody repeats it and they improve, um, that is pretty key because we know one of the keys to long-term behavior change is this concept of self-efficacy and the belief that what I do makes a difference. 
So when that happens, your brain subconsciously goes, hey, all this hard work, it's worth it. Um, so it's a reward to it and it says, you know what? keep doing this behavior and it happens a lot on a subconscious level so that's really why um, BioAge works quite well it's an engagement and retention tool that a lot of gyms use see the biggest loser gets a bit of controversy um, it's interesting because a lot of people um, will bash it and, and you know criticize the biggest loser and, and you know what they're doing and the fact that it's in a very controlled environment and, and that it, it's setting up a false expectation for people. Um, but having um, worked and seen the guys on the show over years, number one is seeing the transformation in those people. And I'm not just talking about the physical transformation because I, I talk to the guys when I'm on the show and, and talk to the trainers um, a fair bit. Um, and it's, it's about that mental transformation that they have. And a lot of these guys completely transform their lives. Um, like Tick Lee Western, who was on it last year, he's now gone on and, and become a personal trainer. He's kept the weight off. He's totally overhauled his life. You, you know, he's a completely different guy um, than he was. But the other thing that is really good about The Biggest Loser is that it, it actually gets people motivated to start. And it gives people a sense of hope. You know, guys who, I talked earlier on about relatedness, and um, people um, who are hugely overweight don't relate to skinny, young, buffed personal trainers, but they do relate to the guys who are on The Biggest Loser. And, and they'll look at it and go, well, actually, if this person can do it, it gives me some hope. And, and so what, it does, what it's very good at, I think, is getting some people started. Um, and it started to become a little bit better in terms of the education and, and side of things. But uh, I think what it does well as well is it, it, is it kind of uncovers the emotions behind things and, and, and the unhappiness that people have. So people can actually identify and relate to it and, and, and that can actually help them in the process of changing. So I actually think it does a lot of good um, uh, despite all the criticism that it can get. Yeah, so with the Richmond guys, um, it started off um, with um, a guy, one of their strength conditioning coaches who does a lot of their rehab, Terry Condon, and he came down and saw our place and, and loved it and brought a couple of the players in, and they just got a different workout, and, and I've been talking to Terry a lot. We, we share a lot of um, similar ideas, and um, not just, ter Terry's very, um, very open in terms of he's not just about the exercise he really likes to get inside people's heads and so do I so we swapped a lot of that then a lot of the players would, would start to come down and, and then some of them got into the boxing so I'll, I'll do some boxing with the guys a lot of them come um, on a Wednesday and we get in and have a bit of a spar but then they introduced me to a guy called Will, Wayne Campbell who runs their leadership team and, and an ex-player so I had a bit of a chat with Wayne about the stuff that I doing the corporate world and, and he thought actually that'd be a really good thing to do and and so I don't think I'm giving away any secrets I've, I've gone in and worked with the leadership team uh, and the senior players around um, that mental toughness and resilience and um, because what what Richmond have been very good they're, they're, they're you know they're planning for the future and and Wayne actually said to me you know those critical moments because I talk a lot about critical moments in the one percenters which really resonated with him and he, he said that we haven't really been in those big games um, where that performance under real pressure counts. He said, but we're getting there in the next couple of years. And what they wanted to do is, is you know, in, get some training in there for the guys to prepare them for those sorts of things. Because sport and, and, and also life is, is really about your performance in critical moments. When that pressure is really on, is, is how do you... Um, just take that stress or arousal in the brain back a little bit of a step. So you see when people choke, you know, they ch choke in sporting, and we see it a lot in high pressure situations. And what's going on? It's, it's, it's driven by the brain, and it, it's too many, uh, too much dopamine and adrenaline or noradrenaline in the brain, too much arousal. And, and that basically shuts down frontal lobes, can interfere with motor control, and that's when people just, you know, they choke a little bit. So it's about just reducing that level of arousal just a little bit, and that puts them back into the peak performance zone and um, where they'll, like, they'll make it. And, and it, there are so many instances of this in sport, 
of that little critical moment where a game completely turns. And so what I'm doing with those guys is is, is just that whole mental toughness side of thing, uh, that performance under pressure, bringing in a lot of my military background and, and the, the, the survival training I went through and the, the interrogation training and, and the lessons from that that can actually be applied in the sporting field. Yeah, look, I, I had a, a very interesting chat with the um, the coach of the Melbourne Rebels about this, um, and look, I, ha- I have a strong belief that these guys are completely within themselves, and and they they do not know themselves really. They they haven't dealt with real pressure and stress, and um, you know, sporting thing is 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 one level of stress. Um, the military is very different, and um, often you go into um, a theatre where you can very well die. Um, I used to be um, an airborne anti-submarine warfare officer, but then after that did um, helicopter search and rescue in Scotland, which was quite dangerous. And, and you know, either me or the pilot, if we made an error, at least four people were dead. Um, so, you know, that's real stuff about performance at critical moments. And, and the military is very good at training you up to that and, and, and bit by bit just loading you and overloading you with stress and continuing to do it so that you adapt to it. Um, because stress is actually a good thing. Stress causes us to adapt. And you know, in, in the gym world um, and the athlete world, um, physical stress causes you to get bigger, faster, stronger. But in, from a psychological perspective, um, uh, it causes you to uh, perform better, to perform at a higher level, to do things quicker and to make better decisions. Um, and it's about that balance between stress and recovery that, that's pretty key. And, but the, you know, the military have had thousands of years of this. And, and also, um, I think we can take a lot of lessons from leadership from the military. Um, because for me, and I talk a lot about organisations, about this when I'm in organisations, it, it is, it's one thing to inspire people to stay at work willingly until 7 o'clock. But it's a whole different ball game to inspire people to go into battle where they will quite possibly die. Um, and a lot of it is driven by things like a sense of purpose and, and a deep belongingness and this really tight knit tribe. And um, so having that sense of purpose and, and that real connectedness to your tribe inspires people to do extraordinary things when the chips are down. And I think the sporting world can learn from that, um, but also the, the executive world can, can learn a lot from what the military has honed over a couple of thousand years in terms of all of their strategies and the way they train people. I'm Paul Taylor, a research professor at University of San Francisco, and you can find out more at www.bodybrainperformance.com.